Hi, and welcome to the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm your host, Father Nathan Castle. And today I have a dear friend that I'm excited to introduce you to if you don't know her already. And my friend Patty Aubrey told me that she will take it from here and uh, tell us a little about herself. So take it away, Patty. Hi there. Thanks for having me, Father Nathan. I really love being here with you. Um, my name is Patty Aubrey. I have been in the self-help industry for about 35 years. And I started at around 24, where I answered an ad in the LA Times that said secretary wanted. And I thought, I don't want to be a secretary, but I wanted 25000 a year back then. Yeah. And so I went to the interview. I didn't get the job. And then the couple that interviewed me called me about three months later and said, actually, we think you're the perfect person. We want you to come back. And so I did. And it turned out to be Jack Canfield, who went on to write and um, found the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series. And when I started with him, we were doing self-esteem in the classroom work for teachers and he came back to the office one day and said, hey, I think we we should put all these stories in a book. Everyone's asking us. It must be like the universe, God, whatever, sending us a note. And so we, when we embarked on this project in 1989, and we got our first book published in 1993 and went on to publish Chicken Soup Books for 18 years. We did 500 million copies. We had seven books on the New York Times list at one time. We were in the Guinness Book of World Records. It was a crazy ride for someone who started at 24 thinking they were going to be a secretary. I quickly yeah. became VP of operations and then president of Chicken Soup Soul Enterprises. And we sold it in 2008. And from then I started to really look at, I want to learn how to be a better speaker. I want to share my message. And my message and my mission now is to help mostly women um, give themselves permission to show up, speak up and be seen. Because I know for me, I hit a lot. I, I I stayed comfortable in my comfort zone and I ran the business side of chicken soup because I knew that. But I passed up a lot of book tours. I, I went on book tours, but I passed up a lot of speaking engagements when they would say, hey, can you come to this Christian women's conference and speak to 10,000 women? I'd say, oh, I'm too busy. And because I was hiding. And oh. so I had to learn to use my voice and and the whole permission granted mission started when my mother was passing away. And she said the last day that she was alive, promise me that you won't hide behind those two guys that you will show up and be seen. I didn't raise a daughter to be invisible. And so I promised, and that's what's kind of my driving force behind me every day. Good for you. It's not exactly from beyond the grave because she got the words out before she left here, but, um, if anybody spoke to me that way, I'd certainly sit up and pay attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want my audience to know how we got acquainted a little bit. So I'll tell that okay. story, short, short form of that story. I began to feel um, not a 24. Well, actually, even when I was back in my 20s, I felt like my mission was to serve God and, and how to do that, how to get the message out of, uh, especially... The, what the church calls the Easter proclamation, uh, Jesus is risen from the dead, and that that's, we're not just happy for him. Uh, he's showing us who we all are, that we're all beings who will always be, and death doesn't have to define us, and neither does anything else limiting. And so, uh, and and the, the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's gospel, like Jesus's last words before ascending, like your mom's last words on her last day here, go out to all the world and tell the good news. Mm. Well, that sounds a little bit like don't hide, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, then figure it out. How do you go out to all the world and tell the good news? I'd already had a, a very fulfilling career in campus ministry and had worked for 12 years at Arizona State, seven at Stanford. But I began to feel that it was time to do a different work and to be with a different population. Um, but how do you do that? And i have been in academia for so long and around students trying to figure out what they're going to be when they grow up. And I was like me trying to figure out what am I going to be in my, <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I grow up, I feel like I'm growing into something new. And so I, I started looking for, uh, for publicity and marketing people that know how to get a message out to a lot of people. Uh, I met Steve Harrison, a friend of yours and was working with his team for a long time. And then they introduced me to, Jack Canfield and to what he often called his rainmaker, Patty Aubrey. And I, um, 
I took money that my parents had put away in case I ever left the priesthood. <laughs> they, 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 they gave, they put a little money aside. My, my dad had only two siblings and they were both nuns, both Dominicans. Um, I always keep their picture close at hand. That's um, like, from like 1937 or something like that. They both okay. had more than 90 years in the order by the time of, of their passings. But um, anyway, I took that money that was kind of like rainy day fund and used it to uh, come and meet uh, you and Jack. You remember when we met the first time yes. in Jack I Solomon did. in Santa Barbara? My dad's first name is Aubrey. And not very many men have that name. But mm -hmm. he, Aubrey Maxwell and his grandfather, my grandfather, his dad had that same name. And so when I saw that this is Aubrey lady, <laughs> I thought, well, <laughs> it's maybe sign. it's a sign. Maybe <laughs> it's a sign. Maybe I'm in the right place. But anyway, you guys helped me uh, imagine taking the message that I felt like I had to give and and doing that on a larger stage. And anymore in, in the times we're living in, it has to be digital. There has mm -hmm. to be a component of it that's online. And you were the one that said to me at one point, uh, you really need to have a podcast. And I just thought that's just ridiculous. How in the world would I do that? But here we go. I've got one now. So okay. thank you for that. You're welcome. What's the main message that you'd like to convey to my audience while uh, we're together today? Well, I think if I could convey any message, I would say that if you're feeling drawn to do something, if there's something inside of you, if there's some dream or passion that you have, listen to it, follow it and say it out loud and share it with everyone, you know, and I find so many people that they have ideas, they have dreams, they have goals, they have visions, but they just keep them inside. And mm -hmm. so they say, but how do you, how do you know when you're ready? And my, my answer is you're never, well, none of us are ever ready, but we can start practicing. We didn't get on a tricycle or a big bike when we were 25, a ride, we got on a tricycle or a little bike. And if we fell over, we were much closer to the ground. So it didn't hurt so bad. And then we got better. And then we took the training wheels off and then we felt comfortable. So it's the same thing with anything new. There's always that, that bridge that you need to cross over and get to the other side. And you can't visualize it. You, you can't think about it. You have to actually take the actions and get into motion. And it's kind of scary. You know, a lot of people are wanting to do a second career or a third career, but if you start to think about it and talk about it and it gets more, you embody it more, people will ask you questions. You'll, it'll make you think. And also somebody that you tell might say, let me support you. And so I say, whatever it is, whatever you're drawn to do, do it now. Yes. You know, my first book was on The Wizard of Oz. That was the project that I brought when I first met you and, and Jack all those years ago. And one of my metaphors for life, really throughout my life, has been if you stay on the yellow brick road, it there's twists and turns in it, and there's somebody around the bend that mm -hmm. you haven't met yet that's going to be a critical companion and helper, that's assistant, true. or whatnot. And I, I've kept finding that to be true when you... When you and you you are a big picture person and you deal with a lot of you know, visioning and so on and uh, but you you combine that with the practicality of staying in the present moment starting <laughs> doing something right now and all of that and I've tried to incorporate that in my life and not let the big picture um, frighten me or you know, you can do that. You can, you can look out at something really large and just think that's too big for me. I'm too mm -hmm. small for that. And, but people really do show up. It's human nature. You know, um, uh, my a friend of mine was saying, uh, last week, one of my coaches, he was saying, you know, when people, if you look at whether they'd rather change or die, yeah, you know, they did a study, uh, the mutual of Omaha did a study years ago with 330 people that were all ill. And they basically said, if you don't change your lifestyle, you're going to die. They went back a year later, only 7% of the people actually changed their lifestyle. And so what they realized was, so they called in Dr. Dean Ornish, they created a curriculum, they had coaching, they had accountability. And so they went back out and said, look, we're serious about this. You know, we, we want to redo this and bring you in. 
And it's okay because we're all human beings and human nature is to stay comfortable. And so in order to get out of that comfort zone, you, you, you most likely need somebody else that believes in you more than you believe in yourself. I did that with you. I did that with Jack. That's my big vision part of my give back. Um, but also having someone to coach you. And when they did this study the second time around 77% of the people after three years were still on the program and were much healthier. Yeah. And so lots of times you need someone to help push you to, because it's scary. You know, you knew what you knew when you were at Stanford or at the university, but when you suddenly go off and do your own thing and it's about you and not the university, you, you're, it's, you're it. And it's a different space to be in, in your head. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the afterlife work that I do and, and you've, you've assisted in a little bit of that, um, I've, I I deal with these people that come in the night and show me the violent circumstance that brought about their death, and they're wanting some help in moving from level to level in the afterlife. They're mo they're mo mostly leaving a therapeutic level that they don't really need anymore because they've been through some healing. But when you get them talking about it, uh, a lot of the healing that needed to happen was just what you were talking about, of being willing to let go of an unhelpful idea and to embrace a new one, to change. And even the, even something like going through a traumatic death, I mean, how, how big of a change? <laughs> there aren't very many more changes larger than that. But that but people can still be resistant to kind of interior change uh, until they're not, until sometimes it's just the right moment. You know, you I don't know if you've ever had that happen where there was some change that you might have been better off making earlier, but there eventually came a moment when you, Kind of gave in or said okay i give up now i guess i will try that yes more than a few yeah more than a few and you know it's always it's always scary but i think for me what one of the hacks or tricks that i use is i think about the things that i've done in the past and when i've had to go to a next level or learn something new or do something scary and I just, I think about the feelings I had right before I did it. And I think about how I was you know, trying to talk myself out of it and everything else. And then I think about the feeling I had once I actually walked through the fire, you know, actually did whatever it was that I had to do. And now I just go back and I don't necessarily look at my success log or my successes. I look at how did I feel before I survived it? How did I feel after? This mm. is just a familiar feeling. I've had it before. I'm going to have it again. It means I'm growing. Yes. And I have to reframe it. Mm. I look at that with regard to my age and, and state of life because I'm 67 now. And I've been through enough things that when something frightens me, I'm pretty good at recognizing fear quickly and saying, oh, you're afraid. Uh, mm -hmm. When's the last time you had this kind of fear? And I usually can do what you just said. I can go back to some experience and say, well, how did that turn out? Uh, I've survived everything. <laughs> and I haven't had that many cat catastrophes. Uh, most of the time, uh, fears are overblown. Uh, I haven't, I think that's the way fear operates in me anyway. I, when when I give give full voice to it, uh, it you know, the terror pictures are worse than the reality ever turned out to be. Uh, Always. Yeah. And I think we you know, we, we have choices. And I think if we choose, here's, here's what I say, we're making up stories about why we're afraid. And so they're not real. There's no facts to them. It hasn't happened yet. Yes. It's just a story. So when you can recognize the stories that aren't supporting you and you can make up new ones that are going to support you, you'll go further faster in less time and spend more energy on, well, if it was possible, what would it look like? And and it, it takes you into a different vibration. It opens you up to getting the downloads that you need. And there are so many different things. I, I know one example I have was when my mother was diagnosed with cancer, my sister was working for me and she said, why don't we do a book called Chicken Soup for the Surviving Soul and we can collect stories for mom. And I said, why would they do that? We work here. And she said, Patty, 
you were here before chicken soup. I mean, if anybody deserves it, you've been eating top ramen for five years, you know, starving to death, making $2 an hour on a good day. Not because I was big, because we were working 18 hour days. And so she convinced me to go in and I went into the conference room to meet with Jack and Mark. And I was so scared. I could barely speak. And I was convinced that they were going to say, well, no. And I finally blurted it out. And they're like, that's a great idea. You should do that. And so first of all, I was taking myself off the field before the coach put me in the game. Yes. And secondly, if I hadn't listened to that, I wouldn't have gone on to do chicken soup with a Christian soul and working mom soul and busy mom. And, you know, I don't know, I did 15 or so books that really changed my life on so many levels. And so it's, if I think about those times, if I had chosen to play it safe, I probably would not be a very happy camper because if you don't ask, it's rarely that someone's going to come up and say, Hey, do you want to do a book? I mean, they, these guys were so busy. They were chasing their tail. Yeah. And so, you know, you've got to speak up and worst case is you get a no worst, worst case is you stay comfortable, you know? And I always say to my, my clients, my friends, like what's keeping you just comfortable enough to stay stuck, which mm sure you have that conversation with people that have crossed over yes well you know in my in the first of my two afterlife interrupted books stuck was in the subtitle helping mm -hmm. stuck souls cross over i got rid of it in the second book because I, I realized that not everyone was stuck some were coming to me just because they were so traumatized uh that they needed healing and and there was a reason why they didn't pass uh easily but some in fact were stuck they were grinding away or most of people in our audience probably know at least one person with PTSD or something similar to it, where something has happened that they just, it is so painful, they can't turn loose of it. And they have to keep going back to it and back to it and back to it. Uh, you ever have a canker sore in your mouth? Where you, you just can't keep your tongue from going over there to feel I... that pain one more time. <laughs> but, uh, and sometimes uh, people just, after a while, they've, can believe that they don't have agency over their own thinking anymore. I'm the victim of my thought processes that are out of control. And mm -hmm. I, I found that both on this plane and the next, there is a way out of that. There are always people that will help. Um, I had this one guy that he died in a, a fall from a tall building. And in the afterlife, he kept falling. And he said, I could I could imagine falling, but I couldn't imagine landing. He just, he, he couldn't allow that in. He said, gravity, in fact, did what it does. <laughs> I did hit the ground and die. But in my consciousness, I just couldn't allow my steps to happen to me. And so instead, I kept falling. Wow. And his guardian eventually said to him, for heaven's sakes, all we ever do is fall. Would you, could we just pause it for a minute? Uh, and would you would you let me take you up? Would you get on my back and let me fly you up for just a minute? We can come back to the falling if that's what you want to do. And and that's what helped him. He 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 said, okay, I hadn't thought of that. And they went up for a little while, and then he did return to the falling because it was so habitual. Mm -hmm. um, and habits yeah. are uh, not just left overnight. Uh, no, they're, and they're not. And and I there's I use that analogy a lot because I think it's a lot of people say, well, I have this limiting belief that I'm not good enough or I can't do this. And I said, well, what if it's just a bad thought? What if it's just a habit? Mm -hmm. And so we have external events that happen, but we also have internal events in our head. Yes. Those stories, those what ifs. But if you can just pause and really think, okay, I intentionally can choose how I want to respond. I don't have to react the same way I always have and keep going back to that. And if I choose a different response, is it possible that I could get a better outcome? And if you start to really own the way you respond to the things that show up in your life with grace or just taking a breath or parking it for a day or whatever it might be, you have a much different outcome for the day. And over time, I say to people, just track your reactions that you have, which I call knee-jerk reactions, and track your responses when you're intentional. 
and just notice over a week or so, what is it, what does your life feel like? How, how much effortless is it? Where do you feel more calm and less anxious, et cetera? Mm-hmm. It's kind of a fun little exercise. Yes. I have one like it, um, that uh, I'm, in my order, Veritas is our motto, the Latin for truth. And one simple thing to do with those voices in your head is to slow it down and go, yeah, but is it true? Mm-hmm. You know, is it true? Uh, and you know, those old cartoons that had a, a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, you know, putting thoughts in people's ears. I, I try not to go too much toward the devil part because I'm already a priest doing afterlife stuff and people want to think that I'm an exorcist and I'm not and all that. So uh, I, but, uh, but I, I am somebody who hears voices in my head that says that say negative uh, limiting things. Uh, and, and I have higher voices that, uh, that uh, help me imagine goodness and, and greatness uh, or possibility. So I, I do sometimes just say to people, uh, be careful which voices you're listening to and don't trust every voice you hear in your head because some of it's mm-hmm. just garbage. You know? Yeah, a lot of it is actually. And just it's practice, practice and practice and practice. We all have it. It's like, oh, there it is again. Mm-hmm. It says offer it a piece of chocolate cake and let it go. Oh, all right. I hadn't thought of the chocolate cake. <laughs> I'm more inclined. Uh, I, 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 uh, I use St. Michael the Archangel a lot. And I'll say to him, Michael, if there is a somebody buzzing around me that is bringing a negative vibe, would you, can we bind them? And would you just take them somewhere away from me? I don't say go to hell. (laughs) I just say anywhere (laughs) else, not around me for right now would be just fine. Would you just take that one away? And that helps me. I, I I then kind of can reset my imagination and my, uh, my consciousness. And I find that the work that I do with it and my prayer partners and I do with people in the afterlife, it's, it's much of it's the same stuff. It's mm-hmm. where our consciousness is the engine of the soul. It goes with us and, and, and it can be a wonderful thing. It can point us in all kinds of great directions. Absolutely. And, and I believe that's true too, here on earth, that you want to be around the people that are positive, that aren't, I say, we have inside critics. We don't need outside critics. Yes. And so when you can share, when, when I said, do a podcast, like, I can't do a podcast. And if I said, yeah, you're right. You can't. It's like, no, no, you can so it's just, it's hanging out with other people that are willing to be uncomfortable in a bigger vision. Well, and- I remember when you said that, and you said it in passing as I was leaving. It was, we weren't in the middle of an important conversation. We were, you know, that retreat that I, where I met you had, what, maybe 18 other people on it or something like that. And so I wasn't the focus of your full attention around the clock, but <laughs> somewhere as I think we were kind of leaving, you said, you really ought to do a podcast. And, and I immediately thought that's ridiculous. Uh, and I think I told you, it sounded like you ought to colonize the moon. How would I do that? Uh, <laughs> and I don't even listen to them. <laughs> I hardly had listened to any podcast, but a couple of years later, um, it was time for that. Yeah. Sometimes it might just be that an idea arrives before you're ready to act on it absolutely it just needs to mature absolutely yeah. i believe that most of the things i have to sit on for a couple of years and talk to myself and talk to everyone else and i finally get to it yeah um i'll bet you've learned too that you don't have to know how to do everything as long as you know somebody that knows how to do what you don't know how to do that is very true that's my secret superpower uh oh, and now it's <laughs> we can edit it out if you want it to say a secret, but uh... no, I it's I was you know, it's funny I I just I'm very strategic I think because growing up with especially starting out with Chicken Soup for the Soul we couldn't get a publisher we were trying to figure out ways to market crazy stuff so my brain just started to think very outside the norm and whether it was hey we could spray paint on the side of the freeway chicken soup for the soul which would be graffiti which was really not legal to whatever it might be um so i i'm i'm pretty creative and strategic and i know the steps that need to happen but because i'm going to be 58 a few weeks i'm not the quickest one to get it done and so i surround myself with people that are much more linear than me um they're very different than i am but we appreciate the differences and they're not afraid of the ideas. And so we sit down and we communicate them and we 
kind of pounded out, which I did, I actually did that all week this week with two other friends to get really clear. And they helped me like lay it out in a form that I could actually then send over to the interior designer, the graphic designers and get it done. Um, so I'm, I choose uh, good people to work with. And I used to scare people because I had these great ideas or big ideas and people would think, oh my gosh, what does that mean for me? And so I've learned to be a little bit more grounded in my delivery. Jack says, you scare the hell out of people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll tell you, then you tell them. Cause you, whenever you have an idea, everybody buys right in. Yeah. Uh, so I've had to learn like who to share the ideas with in the beginning before when they're still half baked and who will ask me the right questions and not to say that's crazy. And then, um, I don't know, maybe it's growing up in Catholic school, the guilt, <laughs> you know, when someone says that's a bad idea, I'm like, okay, is it? So, you know, you just, you kind of learn as you go. And, um, and I love working with younger people because I can empower them to believe that anything's possible. Yeah. And I let them know what I want to be done, but then I get out of the way. And I think so many people that are in our age group, they want to still micromanage it. Like they think they know the way and the kids are going at mock speed. And so when I just get out of my own way, my life gets a lot easier and I can empower them and I get more freedom. So it works. Mm. It's interesting. Well, uh, thank you, first of all, for including me in your demographic. I've got nine years on you, but you said in our age group, uh, I've worked with young people for most of my life for, you know, 18 to 30 year olds in, in college. And I had the same idea that if I, if, if I'm, if I have anything to offer and I offer it now, it might redound all through their life. It might affect the positive marriages and child rearing and careers and so on. And now much of the, the demographic that I'm working with, it's really all over the map, but it's mostly older people. Um, young people don't experience as much death and loss as middle-aged or older people do. Uh, mm -hmm. and, it, and, but you know, Jesus also said, unless you have the heart of a child, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say, I won't let you in. He said, you just won't want in. You'll go to Disneyland and sit in the parking lot. You, you, you won't take part in the fun uh, unless you have the heart of a child. And and one of the things I, I enjoy of the work that I'm doing now, both on the afterlife level and this one, is um, helping people reimagine their circumstance, whatever it is. Even if it has involved the tragic loss of a child or a spouse or whatever, okay. Um, what are other ways that we can think about this? And do you understand that everybody lives after they die? Do you understand that death didn't end your loved one utterly? It transitioned them from plane to plane, but, and then, then I can help uh, people take this Catholic tradition that I know pretty well, uh, having been baptized at three weeks old, and say, you don't have to buy the whole thing, but there are some component parts of it that I've found really helpful, and maybe you would too. Have you thought of this? And then you're exceeding their imagination, you know? Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Well, my I chose the, uh, the name of my podcast to be The Joyful Friar. It's actually St. Dominic's nickname, the founder of our order. And he told me that he never used that to refer to himself anyway. So go right ahead. He, never, he said, I never <laughs> called myself that. Uh, but go ahead and use it if you want. Uh, but joy is really important to me. And it's part of the reason that I joined this order and not all of the other ones. There's such a, if for anybody that ever thought of doing this, there's just such a tangle of them. There's loads and loads of them. How do you distinguish one from the other? Uh, but joy was always really important uh, to me in giving a message of joy. So I'm wondering um, uh, what gives you joy, especially on a day that doesn't have natural uh, success going on in it. What gives you joy, like on a bad day or on a kind of a neutral day? Um, um, let's see, on a neutral day. I don't know if that's the best word for it, but anybody can be joyful when they won the lottery or <laughs> whatever. Oh, but yeah. But um, um, on an, an average day or maybe a below average day. You know, I I think I'm pretty simple actually, but I love to spend time with friends and my kids. And you know, the older I get, the more I realize it's not about the quantity, it's about the quality of time. I just recently got back from London where I took a week off and 
went with my best friend who is runs a foundation and they were talking about like third, fourth, fifth generation money. So I just tagged along and, um, and I said, I no, I shouldn't go. I have so much. And she said, when are you going to, when are you just going to say, I'm just going. And so, and I went, but I kind of felt like, should I be going? It's going to be freezing in London, you know, but I'd never been, I don't know. It doesn't sound like great. I had the most fun ever. And so I think it's when, you know, when I'm, when I'm starting to feel a little bit like, mm, not great or just kind of down or tired. I do the things I don't want to do. I go golfing with my husband and I end up having a blast. I get on the Peloton and I realize I need to do it more. I call a friend. I might call a student that I'm just thinking about just to check in for no reason. I just do things that are, it, I don't know, just kind of to be connected to others and to maybe be there for them. But what it does is it fuels my tank to it. It comes full circle, you know, when you're serving, which you've been doing your whole life, as you know. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of what I do. And then every now and then I get some Netflix in. <laughs> <laughs> What's something that you're on a lot of podcasts. Is there anything that interviewers never ask you? I know. I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I did send it to you in show notes. Right. So you would know that. that do, was do you practice everything you preach? Uh, no. Okay. So I often say someday I'll write a book called take my advice. I'm not using it. Oh, all right. That's a great title because I'm human. So I don't get up every day and meditate and pray and work out and be perfect. I'm lots of times a hot mess. Right. And, um, and I used to judge myself for those days, but I think with the crazy creativity also comes the other side of that. And there are days where I just, you know, sometimes I talk for so long to so many people. I just need to not talk to anybody except for my dog. And um, so, okay. yeah. um, but I, I don't, I don't think that I should be different now. I used to feel guilty or shameful. And I think those are such horrible feelings that don't serve anyone. And now I just say, you know, it just is what it is. You know, one of the things I like about you, let me count the ways, there are so many, but one of them is that there's nothing about you, even though you do seminars and, you know, uh, people pay to be in your presence and hear what you have to say. Your message isn't, I can show you how to be like me. Mm -mm. No, I, I feel as though I'm a little bit more mission oriented and I just, I don't want to be the one. I, if I, if I need to use my voice and I need to share my stories and I need to inspire others, I will, but everything that you need is in a book or it's on Google or chat GT, GPT. And so I feel like I'm just there to say, look, I was just this average Valley girl that grew up in a very middle-class neighborhood that took forever, seven years to go through school, you know, to get it, my education and business. And then I end up working for a hippie. So, you know, if I can survive it and do something good, so can you. But even that first job, when I said I was going to work for Jack Canfield, my father freaked out. I mean, he was from Iowa, you know, you work in corporate and, but something inside, and it wasn't the most money. I could have made a lot more money somewhere else, but something just said, do it. And I didn't know anything about self-help. I had no idea why I was saying yes to this. And was Jack still, um, he was high school teacher right out of college, right? And uh, yes. what was he doing when he first hired you? He was, he had just started his own company called Self-Esteem Seminars. Okay. And he was teaching teachers how to, facil how to facilitate self-esteem to the kids in the classroom. All right. So he was in the, um, the educational infrastructure of helping teachers teach better. Correct. All right. Yeah. That doesn't sound like um, corporate America. <laughs> or no. and he had an overhead projector with crayons for slides and these old ancient computers. And luckily I was pretty tech savvy because I did have a tech job before I met him. Right. And I, he left and then he came back three weeks later. I said, I changed my card to vice president of operations and I ordered two new uh, Apple computers and a laser printer. And it's going to be 40,000 less than we pay for that guy that comes in every quarter to rewrite our software, which we don't have to do anymore. <laughs> he was like, uh. okay. <laughs> yeah. So, 
it was kind of, he was an easy, he was easy to push around. It was kind of nice. <laughs> well, I think part of the message I got from both of you being around you uh, uh, was things will work out. You know, if, if you just say yes to the dream and you, and then you're dedicated to it, people will emerge, mm -hmm. stuff will happen. I, I, uh, I got through all of my education and there was a lot of it. I, I was in college for years and years on a typewriter and I'm the last person in the world that uh, would have thought that I'd be doing all this tech stuff. And especially because of the pandemic, uh, speaking to live audiences dried up. And, mm -hmm. and then right at the same time, there was a hunger for spiritual things because even people that belonged to a church, a mosque or a synagogue, they were all closed. People couldn't access a faith community if they had one. Uh, yep. And so a lot of people were online looking for things right about the time that I started doing a lot of online teaching and uh, seminars and uh, podcasts, other people's podcasts, and then eventually my own. But um, there are always somebody that knows how to do what you don't know how to do. You really don't know how to. And in all those years that I was directing staffs at Newman Centers, I employed about 21 people at one point. I didn't know how to do their jobs. I just had to know whether they were doing it well or not. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to know the nitty gritty of it. I just had to see the results and and be able to direct. Um, uh, yeah, did have you done some theater? I don't know if that, if you have that in your background at all. No, but it's uh, I I have it on my vision board to do a one woman stand up act about the whole like the scoop behind the soup, you know, chief oh, chicken right. and kind of like kind of a spoof on self-help at some point, because along the way, so many crazy things have happened. <laughs> they weren't necessarily on brand for chicken soup, but, um, but like you were saying, you know, we stuck with whatever we did, nothing got in the way. We knew we had a big dream. And I mean, we didn't dream about having all these books. We just won one book, but when the feedback started coming in, we knew we had something bigger than ourselves and that we were here to take we were here to raise the kids responsibly. So regardless of whatever showed up, whether it was a problem between the two of us or with a publisher or a market, we, we had to go back to the drawing board and there was no option. There was no give up option. Mm. Well, I, I've been a director much of my life. That's been my title a lot of places. And I did direct a couple of plays when I was in seminary. And I, I'm, I have a book that I'm, I'm working on uh, that's going to have a title with something like scripture script or something john's gospel i think wasn't really a short story to begin with i think it was a, a script and so i want to take the gospel of john and crowdsource it with people that uh that can imagine let's read this chapter and how would you stage it so on so that's one of my current that's projects great. but i but i remember leaving arizona state after 12 wonderful years that was where i learned how to do development we went we raised six and a half million dollars and tore the place down and and I wasn't there for the new building later that happened. But um, but even though you might have a lot of success, uh, I, I remember telling people at a banquet in my honor as I was leaving that director uh, uh, is from the word rectum. And that you're and I just means through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm 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 out of here, um, but but uh, you you don't have to take yourself seriously to have a lot of success along the way. You just need to kind of step on the path and count on people showing up to help and then making some critical decisions. And that, and then that means not letting fear be the, the, the thing that dictates the decisions you do make. Absolutely. Do I sound I'm, like a preacher? No, it's just, it's true. It's like a lot of people spend a lot of time in the, what if it doesn't work mode? I mean, yeah. we don't, that's not a fact. I mean, that's just a story. So let's, if we're going to make something up, let's make it up. That's positive. That's a high vibration that people are excited about Because if we show up like Eeyore, no one wants to be around that kind of energy. But if we show up with the, the more clear and the more exciting vision, people want to follow, they want to get enrolled. They want to help. And you know, that's what I love about helping the people I work with. I know that they have more in them. And if I can just kind of coddle them along a little bit and, and they get it and the lights go on, then 
they can go change the world on their own level. And that's, you know, that's, that's good for them. I mean, it's just one of those things we have to remind ourselves that it's all made up. So let's make it up. Not everything. I'm not gonna say all that's a generalization, but those things that we tell ourselves are made up. And even the opinions that people have outside, those are just opinions. They are not facts. And so keep people near you that want to keep supporting you and believe in you on the days that you don't believe in yourself. And if you live your joy and you use that as your meter, you'll stay on track. And when we're not in joy, we know we need to look inside and see what's going on. We're off track a little bit. Okay. And it's normal. All right. Well, we only have a few minutes left and I want you to have an opportunity to tell my audience, uh, how you can help them and how they can access the helpful things that you have to offer. Well, they can go to my website, which is uh, www.pattyaubrey.com. And Aubrey is A-U-B-E-R-Y. And you can schedule a 15 minute free session with me okay. and um, see if there's any kind of fit on the things that I'm doing. And if so, um, we'll see what that looks like. Sweet. That's exactly what I was hoping to hear that there will be some a simple entry level point where a person could have a few minutes of your time and see if you're if 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 you hit it off. Absolutely. We certainly did. Yes, I love that stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful for your presence in my life and the help that you've been to me, and and grateful again that you uh, uh, said yes to being on my little podcast. My pleasure. It was good to see you. All right. Okay. God bless you. God bless you. Be well. All right. right. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Joyful Friar. You can visit me at nathan-castle.com. Send me a message by clicking the contact button. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can make a donation by clicking the donate button. See you next time.